now time to talk about being in the zone. Former England cricket captain and now psychoanalyst Mike Brearley discusses his book On Form with well-known sports journalist Suresh Menon. Please put your hands together for both of them, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's such a pleasure to be here. And it's an even greater pleasure to be here with uh, Mike Brearley, one of the great names in the sport and a person who is probably the greatest cricket thinker of our times. I'll start uh, by reading you a letter from The Guardian many years ago. Uh, it, it begins like this. A, a reader had written, On Friday, I watched J.M. Brearley directing his fieldsmen very carefully. This, uh, don't forget, was uh, not don't forget, let me remind you, was during the famous Headingley Test match, which we shall come to shortly. On Friday, I watched J.M. Brearley directing his fieldsmen very carefully. He then looked up at the sun and made a gesture which seemed to indicate that it should move a little squarer. Who is this man? It is difficult to describe who this man is in the short period we have here because apart from being one of the great captains of the sport of the game, cricket, in fact, if you had a sort of a word association game and you said ca cricket captain, the first name that would probably pop into your head is Mike Brearley. That apart, he's also taught philosophy. He's a practicing psychoanalyst. So you would imagine that if there's one person who could analyze or describe or explain the strange game called cricket, it would be him. And that is more or less the case, as you see in this book on form, in which he deals with not just cricket, but cricket's place in life and what it means to analyze cricket from three different directions of psychology, psychoanalysis and, and cricket itself and the literature and the rich literature uh, that is connected with the game. As, as many of you know here, CLR James wrote many years ago, what do they know of cricket who only cricket know? And I suppose you could extend that to what do they know of psychology or psychoanalysis who only psychology or psychoanalysis know. So it's 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 a wonderful it's a wonderful idea this that cricket lends itself to analysis in so many ways. It it, it is a it is a testimony to the richness of the game. It is a testimony to the to the fact that uh, it is a full-time, full lifetime occupation. I've certainly made it mine, and uh, Mike has his, but in a much wider sense. Uh, I will not take up too much of your time with this introduction, except to say, Mike, we are, we are really grateful, we're thankful that you're here, and we look forward to the rest of the session. The book is on form, and uh, it, it comes many years, maybe 30 years after Mike's other masterpiece, which is On Captaincy. And if you read On Captaincy and On Form together, and of course, when you read just two books, there's a part of you, the, something in the back of your mind which says, maybe these two are a part of a trilogy. Perhaps they are, we'll, we'll, we'll find out soon. Uh, what is form? Form is not something that's easily explained. Or, or, or defined, you know form. It's, it's to some extent, I guess it's, it's a bit like pornography. You know form when you see it, but you can't explain it or describe it. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw the question to Mike, which is a bit unfair, I know, at the start of the show. Uh, how do we start? How do we look at form and start to get a sense of what form is? Suresh, thank you very much for that. Um, First of all, I want to say that Ray Illingworth was asked about me as captain, and he said, um, the best captain, he said? I'd say the luckiest. And, and actually, thinking of the 1981 series, there was a huge amount of luck in that. 
But anyway, we'll leave that to one side. You asked me about being on form. And I suppose in some ways it's easier to know to know it from when it goes away, which I have plenty of experience of. But when one thinks of occasions where one loses form, and I start the book with a little, a little story of staying with some, a family whom I enormously admired when I was a young adult or a, a late adolescent, probably both. And um, uh, I was so happy in have this, this weekend. I was the only guest. They treated me very well. I was the center of attention. We played games. We went and played pitch and park golf. And in the middle of the golf round, a whole group of other friends arrived. And suddenly they seemed to me to be loud and intrusive. And the other people were friendly, to, my friends were friendly to them too. And I lost my role as being the center of attention. And suddenly, not only could I not enjoy the social event, but I couldn't even hit the golf ball straight. And so there was a moment of losing form that had a clear emotional cause. And I, that's where I start the book. And so there's, there's one moment of losing form in an obvious way. Instead of hitting the ball straight, it was going like that and like that. Uh, and, I and I knew it had to do with my emotions of feeling excluded. The idea that uh, the erroneous idea that uh, being in form is the same as being in the zone. Uh, these are terms that are familiar to uh, a lot of people here because I can see a lot of first class cricketers here in the crowd and, and, and they know what being in form means and they know what being in the zone means. But they're not quite sure if, if they're synonymous. And you, of course, make it very clear that they're two, two different things. Uh, and, and not just in cricket but in various other aspects of life. Yes, I, I think of in, in the zone as being something that it, it can be a moment, a catch, or a shot, a single shot, or, or a stroke, or something. Um, and, or, or you might think of that ball that uh, Stark bowled to um, Vince, round the wicket that pitched about middle and hit the top of off at about 90 miles an hour. So everything goes right, and you, he probably felt everything was right as he bowled that ball, and then it landed on this crack, and everything matched it in the external world. And for that moment, he was utterly elated, as he so he should be. Um, but it's very different from um, on form, which is a more gradual thing, something that takes time to emerge, which includes moments of struggle or difficulty or uh, having to rely on your sense that you've got something good after all. Um, form is a more... Um, it's, it's a concept that applies over a period of time as opposed to at a short moment. Of course, you can be in the zone for a, long, a longer time as well. And being in the zone is also dangerous because you can get too excited or complacent. And I have a story in the book about Ayrton Senna, the motor racing driver, who apparently did a practice lap at Monte Carlo uh, in two seconds faster than anyone else had done it and did several laps and when asked how he was afterwards after this practice run he said he was in a different state than ever before he felt as though he and the car were one and then he said and I realized that it, I was at much more danger and I better not drive again that day so that's the difference between being on the form and being in the zone do, do cricketers then like poets I would imagine uh, al always then look for that state that they were once in when they were in the zone and 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 do they have do they have the discipline to get there or do they do they feel frustrated and 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 poets of course mostly uh, kill themselves uh, cricketers don't do that i mean not not a lot of them anyway so how how do they cope with that knowing that this was possible once i was good enough to hit hit the top of off stump swinging the ball away from the right hander pitching on middle and leg and, and I've lost it, so is life worth living? Is, is the game worth playing? Well, I think that's a real, a real question for people. You know, have, have I lost it forever? Will, I ever happen, will it ever happen again? It's a little bit like being in love. I mean, <laughs> at our age, <laughs> we feel differently about it from what we felt 50 years ago. Um, so I think um, 
it is a difficulty. On the other hand, I suppose a professional can become a bit sarcastic, a bit sardonic, a bit uh, more realistic, sometimes almost too realistic or too professional, and can lose that excitement, that reason for doing things, that you want to do it perfectly, even if only for a little while. Is that, is that where we, we come to the question of uh, thinking too much? I, I, I'll, I'll uh, give you a recent example, uh, which was during the IPL last year. Two, two young boys who were playing for the uh, Delhi team, one of them said to the other, Rishabh said to the other boy, told Sanju, they, they were chasing for a, for a difficult target, they were cha chasing a difficult target and beginning to get there but still uh, sort of, so one of them, I think, I think Rishabh Pant told the other boy, he said, uh, uh, they met in the middle of the weekend and they said, I've, I've, I've got advice for you, just hit, don't think. So, so is action the, the enemy of thought in, in such a case? Yeah. It's such a delicate matter that you might say that sport is articulacy in action. And in some ways it is. You see someone doing just the right thing over a period of time. Let's say batsman. Everything seems to be right. He comes forward, he back, he cuts, he pulls, he drives. He treats the ball on its merits, but he's on top of the bowling. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> no, is that is that uh, is action? Uh, is thought oh, the thought. A, uh, enemy of action? And and for those moments, he may not be thinking very much at all. And yet, we always are, as a professional, I think, or as a top player, good player, you're monitoring all the time. And if you can't monitor, you can't learn how to change things. And I have a chapter in this book of Derek Randall's innings of 150 at Sydney against Australia in 1979, uh, which turned a test match round. And was a very dour innings, actually. It was one of the, I think it was the slowest test century at that time that there ever was, or something like that, or the longest. And um, uh, he, he'd got out twice in the series before, including the first innings for naught, hooking and being caught uh, before he got in. And the manager, who was Doug Insole, who died recently at the age of 91, said to him, you've got to um, get yourself in before you start hooking. And Randall said, nervously, um, but that's my nature. I've got to get the ball in the middle of the bat and I've got to play a few shots, then I feel all right. And Doug Insole said, well, if that's the way you think about your nature, you better think some more about your nature. And you've got to do something, you've got to play for intervals, you've got to play for time, you've got to get yourself in. Uh, in other words, you have to find your nature and your true potential and your true way of playing, but you also have to question it all the time. And it seems to me that that sort of delicate balance is like the balance between spontaneity and discipline, or the conscious and the unconscious mind but occasionally we can get that balance right. So there's not too much intrusive thought, but on the other hand, we notice when we're doing something slightly wrong. Your head's going too far over to the offside and you're playing across the, the stumps. So I think that balance between spontaneity, emotionality, being in the zone, letting things flow, and on the other hand, thought, reflection, self-criticism, monitoring. It's a bit like the chap in the middle. You need to have that conversation in your own head. Yes, which, which, uh, which, which you've, uh, you've evoked uh, Wittgenstein very uh, eloquently there when he said, uh, quoting him saying, uh, don't think, just do. Uh, he may have been entirely right yeah. <laughs> at that moment. Yes. Uh, does that mean, I mean, it occurs to me that we're, we're talking about uh, being in the zone, which is easy to understand with a, with, a, with a batsman playing the cover drive or playing the hook, or basically being an attacking player. Can you be in the zone as a defensive player? Are you, are you in the zone uh, as, as a boycott or a, or a Gavaskar? Are they in the zone, zone when they play defensively too? Yes, they can well be. I mean, it isn't just flair and flourish. Yes. Um, and Atherton, I, I, I describe Atherton's innings of 10 hours against South Africa. I think he got 180, did he not out? 
And um, he came off the field, and Shield Berry interviewed him, and apparently he wasn't tired at all. And he'd been in the zone. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a, f um, a flourishing innings. It was a magnificent innings. Um, he could have been out there till the cows, the wild animals came home, uh, Shield Berry said, uh, and he was above, detached from the action, sufficiently hardly to notice other things going on around him. He just kept playing. And I think he was as much in the zone as a Sobers or as a Botham or, I don't know, one of the more Gower or a yeah. more elegant attacking player. Uh, I, uh, talking about being uh, above and detached from the action uh, brings me to the unexpected uh, comparisons and the unexpected fields into which you have ventured in the book. And when you say uh, what, what uh, you say about being above the action immediately brings me to this, the story of the tree cutter in India, who, who you describe in great detail, and how his, his state of mind, which he's arrived at through, through experience and through instinct, applies to everything from music to literature to cricket. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story of, of, the, of the tree cutter. I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, and this man, I, I'm afraid of heights. And I saw this man climbing trees of up to 80, 100 feet even, and cutting branches off them. He had no protective gear. He had no helmet. He had no, uh, no refuge. He just climbed up the tree with an ax in his T-shirt and some ropes. And he would attach the ropes above and uh, throw the ropes down to people below. And with this ax, he would stand on the branch, sometimes doing things with two hands like this, sometimes leaning over and doing it from underneath, sometimes left-handed, sometimes right-handed. And I sat in a chair watching this man with my palms sweating. And he was like an acrobat in the tree. And I was so impressed by him that I uh, got my wife to translate and I did an interview with him and he talked about um, being on form and actually like Don Bradman he said he, he couldn't he wasn't ever off form somebody asked Don Bradman what's it like to be off form and Don Bradman said I'm afraid I can't answer that question because I never was and um, I mean he got plenty of ducks Fred, Brad, um, Fred Bradman Don Bradman but he always felt he was on form and this man I suppose in a way he said I couldn't afford not to be on form but if he felt really unwell, or he had a sore foot, or he just was too unwell, he would refuse to climb. So he wouldn't cut in any mood. But whenever he cut, he said he was never afraid, but he always knew the danger. And at times he'd know the danger was heightened. You know, for example, the tree was wet, and it's more slippery if it's wet. So. He was a wonderful example of someone who was calm, who was philosophical, who uh, knew his limitations, but also was confident about his strengths, and he could more or less always be on form. I mean, I also talked to, to not, a, not a tree surgeon, but a neurosurgeon. I didn't talk to him, I read his book, Henry Marsh, who wrote a book called Do No Harm. And he spoke about times where he did make mistakes and he did get overconfident or tried to be like the great neurosurgeons and, and how sometimes he would be led to do an operation or do a procedure because the family was so desperate to persuade him to do something. And it might not have been the best thing to do. So it was really interesting to come across another man who held life and death in his hand who uh, acknowledged his fears. D does that uh, bring it down to, well not bring it down, bring it up to uh, a level of, of technique? Uh, I think you've quoted Greg Chappell uh, somewhere saying that uh, uh, with good technique you can, you can forget about technique. And, and does that, uh, which, which also segues in nicely with what we were talking about earlier where you say that uh, there are certain things you should be aware of as a, as a sort of a grand overall picture. Yeah. And there are certain things that you have to be very 
a specific. I, I have to worry about the next ball, the ball after. But I don't. I, uh, at, at some stage, I kind of uh, detach my mind from the from the overall issue, the overall problem. Yes, Greg, Greg Chappell wrote to me. Uh, I asked him about being on form ages ago, and he and he wrote to me about batting, and he said that you uh, predestination. He said, no, premeditation is the graveyard of batting. And um, so I said, but you know, what about? deciding whether you're going to hook a certain ball or let it go or try to let it go or, or what about um, looking to be on the front foot and then he made a differentiation between um, a sort of broader strategy as you said and on the other hand opening yourself up entirely to the next ball he said the broader strategy would be to have in the back of your mind whether you're going to hook somebody or not to have in the back of your mind he said where you might score a boundary off each particular bowler but so far in the back of your mind that it didn't interfere with being totally open to what happened next and actually there are psychoanalysts including Freud who said exactly the same thing about being a psychoanalyst there were, Freud said one mustn't have um, wishes or expectations as a psychoanalyst because if you have wishes you'll distort what you hear to match your wishes and if you have expectations you'll be too disappointed you'll be too critical you won't be able to respond openly to what the patient tells you and beyond another psychoanalyst said you have to avoid what was it a desire and memory now of course you need desire and memory you know the patient you know the past you know this that and the other thing but you have to put it to the back of your mind and be open to what is happening in the here and now. And I think that's the message of Chapel. How, how, much, of, uh, how much of that insight, uh, how much of the uh, insights came uh, as a part of your training professionally? I, I, I know this is a bit like asking Gary Sobers, how many wickets did you take with spin and how much with uh, medium pace? But how much of that came after your cricketing days and, and uh, how much were you uh, kind of instinctively aware of in your playing days? Well, I was aware that too often I was tense and anxious and trying to think too much. Like, I mean, as a batsman in particular, and sometimes as a captain too, like that, that young man in the middle of the field. Um, so I was aware of it, but I think it's easier to reflect on once you've stopped playing, <laughs> or when you're in your press box. <laughs> you're writing about the game uh, it's a bit easier from that distance than it is when you're actually doing it um, and and of course getting the balance right as I've implied is an art in itself and there aren't any rules for it because you, know, you have to be monitoring uh, but you also have to be letting yourself respond true we, we are all great cricketers in the press box in, yes. in fact I've, yeah. I mentioned that uh, in the vision book where he, he quotes you as saying during the tour, during the an India tour, he said that uh, the English batsmen are not stepping out to the spinners often enough. And then you played North Hands against Vision and you stepped out and you were stumped. <laughs> yes, in fact, I think I wrote about, yes, I wrote about yeah. the England players. They weren't going down the pitch and attacking Bishan Bedi. <laughs> I think I got 14 and was stumped <laughs> sharp bowl Bedi in a county match the next time I played. <laughs> yes, Vision, Vision keeps reminding me of that every now and then. <laughs> he reminds me too. <laughs> how, 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 important is, how important is it to uh, all these things that we just talked about, how important is that for a captain? How much, how much of that should he be aware of? And is there again the danger of a captain who, who over analyzes, uh, who with this sort of uh, paralysis, paralysis through analysis uh, kind of a situation? Uh, would you would you have a captain who uh, who goes by instinct uh, in a large sense, or somebody who who sort of uh, overthinks it and and therefore is not is not good for the players? <laughs> I mean, one can think of occasions where going for it instinctively and emotionally turned out for the good, and you can think of occasions where it turned out for the bad, and with the thinking. You can overthink, you can overplan, 
Len Hutton once said, when he was captaining England, you can think of all, so all sorts of plans in your mind, but once you get out on the field, you throw them out of the window. Which actually is surprising about Len Hutton. You might think differently about him. You might expect differently. So, I, again, um, a bit like bringing up children. Um, do, you, do you bring up your children or your grandchildren, as I've got to? Do you, do you bring them up thinking about it or spontaneously reacting? And obviously it's a mixture of the two. And it, that sort of judgment is crucial. So, so you could have uh, such a person as a, a, a good bad captain or a, or a bad good captain. Yes, that's a nice phrase. Which, which is... Uh, a good bad captain might be someone who's not particularly good tactically yes. or not particularly good analytically, but actually was enthusiastic in the right way, who responded to the players in ways that they could respond to, though actually they want some right decisions as well, you know. Yeah. They do want you to get a few things True. right <laughs> of a tactical kind. But who, so yes, the, I mean, I always think of captaincy as having two broad channels or, or threads to it, one of which is getting enough decisions right, when to change the bowling, how to set the field, tactically, strategically, and the other is how to respond to players so that they want to play for you and with you and uh, you give them options that may help them grow themselves. You, you had mentioned in your earlier book on captaincy about uh, another aspect which is when to take advice and when not to. So that's, that's, that's a very fine uh, line, isn't it? Yes, uh, I mean I, I also come to it in this book on form because um, I tell the story of being in South Africa as a young hopeful, age 22, and um, being in the nets, and uh, uh, an elderly gentleman, as it seemed to me then, about 10 years younger than I am now, but anyway, and it came and said, could I have a word with you about your batting after I'd finished my net? And I said politely, yes, of course. And, and he said, you're holding the bat too tightly with your left hand, especially in your arms. You want to relax a bit more. And I thanked him politely and went on my way, and somebody told me, that was Wally Hammond, one of the great stylists and one of the great English batsmen of all time. But I didn't really take it seriously. And so I didn't take this piece of advice. And I started to lose form and I went to different people and I got different bits of advice. And I got into a muddle and I got tense. And it took me about 10 years to, <laughs> to hear it from someone else. So yes, one can fail to take advice in damaging ways. And, and the reverse is equally true because uh, I was talking to Bhagat Chandrasekhar, whom you know, of course, the Indian bowler recently, and he said, I gave uh, uh, Kumble, Anil Kumble, who came much later, only one, bit, one piece of advice. I said, he, he told him, uh, as you go along, people will keep giving you advice. They'll say, spin the ball more, bowl slower through the air, flight the ball, run slower. He says, all you have to do is be very polite, listen to them, and ignore them. Yeah. Which, which I thought was a, was a great piece of advice because uh, for, for a youngster coming through the, uh, th yeah. through the system, to hear a senior person to say, saying that. Uh, well, the senior person. You're talking <laughs> about <laughs> quickish spin bowling, yes. which they both were, of That's course. True. Uh, who else would have been a better yes. advisor? Uh, absolutely true. But I, I, I mean, I made that mistake with Derek Underwood at one point. Derek Underwood was also a quickish spin bowler. I mean, not, not a leg spin mm. googly bowler, but an orthodox bowler. And I once, when he was struggling, suggested he bowled a bit slower and tried to spin the ball more and flight it more. And he couldn't do it. I mean, he tried. And we wasted a few games. And we went back to doing it, you know, the way he'd always done it. So you have to learn. So I did learn something from that. I did <laughs> <laughs> from that yes. failed bit of advice. Coming back to uh, the book on form, are there, are there um, different kinds of form? Uh, um, is, is, is my form the same as your form, the same as someone else's? How, how, and how do you, how do you uh, arrive at that? Yes, I mean, one could even say my form on a Monday is not the same as my form on a Tuesday, 
or my form when I was 20 is not the same as it was when I was 40 or 30. Um, so we're, e even we're different in the form our form takes at different stages. One of the things I think I learned from writing the book was, or learned more clearly, was how there are phases. There are phases in one's career, phases in an innings, phases in a season, and one has to go through different phases of levels of form and styles of form. And then on top of that, of course, there are totally different characters of form. You, we think of, in England or from a certain generation, we think of Hutton and Compton. Hutton, Yorkshireman, very orthodox, correct, dour, opening batsman, not flamboyant, wouldn't take too many risks, very Yorkshire. <laughs> and Compton, brill cream, dashing, come in from a party at five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> go out and bat and score a hundred, borrow someone's bat, go down the wicket and late cut, hook off his eyebrows, play unorthodox shots. You know, and actually the two great pre and post war English batsmen. And you'd say that form for one was a very different kind of thing from form for the other. And I think, as we were saying earlier, in every generation and every team, there are those kinds of different sorts of players. And you often you need both. Or bowlers, you know, Ian Botham wanted to take a wicket with every ball, uh, would, wouldn't mind being hit for four, would bowl a bouncer, would bowl a half volley, but a swinging half volley, a slower ball, an in-swinger, you know, you didn't know what you were going to get. He might go for 10 off the first over. He might have two wickets in the first over. Or you have someone like Mike Hendrick or Chris Old, who are accurate, more defensive, didn't like having runs scored off them, and often made a very good foil for Ian Botham. So I think one needs both styles. And finding out what suits one is one difficulty of learning what form is for each of us. Yes, I, 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 I agree with the point to make about there being cricketers, uh, similar kinds of cricketers in, in generations because in the, in the years that I was growing up and uh, starting to follow the game uh, passionately, we had the, 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 the Gavaskar, uh, Gavaskar was one school and, and Vishwanath was the other, yes. the, the sort of Apollo and the Dionysius, if you will. And, and uh, I, don't think, I don't think the uh, arguments have ended t today. I mean, there are s equally strong sort of fans of each who, who, who will not sort of uh, accept the other side's uh, arguments. And I think, I, I, I think that's, that's important to a team because, again, coming back to what you said in your book on captaincy, you said that unlike a rowing team, uh, a cricket team lives by dint of differentiation. So you need you need a variety of people. You need a variety of players. You need uh, uh, doing different things rather than as in a rowing team, everybody is sitting and 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 pulling backwards. And I think I think some of the some of the more uh, uh, some of the things I've enjoyed most most in the book has been the sheer unexpectedness of of uh, connections. Uh, th there's a quote uh, I, I I like very much. Uh, um, it's it's you know the context is not uh, necessary but uh, there's a delightful uh, story about uh, uh, Nehru and Bertrand Russell. You're, you're talking about the uh, I will provide the context. You're talking about the the culture in which a person grows up and and you're talking about how Nehru and uh, Bertrand Russell were discussing uh, being an atheist and Russell apparently told uh, Nehru that you know we are both atheists and you know we. Uh, and and, uh, and and Nehru said, no, there is a difference. You are a Christian atheist. I am a Hindu atheist. And I thought that that is a marvelous way of uh, getting into the, the sort of cultural differences, which also make for uh, differences in the kind of uh, approach in, in, in sport. There is also, there's also you, you also talk about how uh, great players are conscious of uh, being in the zone, like like Pele, you talk about Pele in in Pele in the 1958 uh, year, uh, World Cup, where he says again, as as you were describing earlier, I felt one with the ball, and I felt I could do anything, and I and I thought that 
uh, I mean, short of saying I thought I could fly, I mean, he, 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 he's... Uh, yes, he said, I think he said, I felt as though I could run through the opposition. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 weren't, they, they wouldn't stop him in any yeah. way. You know, he could, almost like he had no body, or they had no body. Yes. He could just go through them. Yeah. How much, how much has writing this book uh, changed you? I, I, I like the story you say initially about uh, uh, going to the psychoanalytic society, uh, the training society, yes. where, where they thought that uh, you didn't have the uh, experience to be accepted. And then, uh, of course, it was discovered that Mike had uh, happened to captain the England team, and the society said, oh, if you've captained a cricket team, then you're qualified. Not quite. <laughs> which, um, which is a wonderful thought that uh, it, it's, it's a sort of a, uh, it, it's, it's life in sort of a smaller measure. Yes, has it changed me? I mean, cer certainly I, I now know it's, again, how difficult it is to write a book. I mean, and, and that again, one goes through phases. You have a sort of honeymoon phase where ideas come, there's no worry about chapters or <laughs> logic or narrative logic and you know sometimes you even feel you have a good idea or two and you write them down and you and then the, 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 the feelings that you it's boring or it's tedious and then are you digressing too far or should I be more rigorous or what is the narrative logic and uh, and it's too long and it's you have to keep n nagging away at it you know so I think that business of phases and of going through difficult patches, certainly I had that in the process and experience of writing the book. And there is a chapter on that near the yes. end of the book. Um, I think another thing that I sort of realize as I get older is that there are many things we learn as a result of difficulty, of getting through difficulty. And you don't know whether someone's going to survive difficulty, real difficulty, and learn from it or whether they're going to collapse under it and one can never be quite sure and as a psychoanalyst you might say something to someone introduce them so them to themselves in such a way that they might be very disturbed by it and you're never quite sure which way it's going to go and there's a risk involved but actually it's also the case that sometimes as in Victorian novels people only learn to become better people by something terrible happening to them. They have a very bad illness or their wife dies or somebody goes mad in the family or something awful happens. So I think that trying to face the fact that difficulties can be learned from and that one doesn't know what's going to come next. Like I had a driver in India, a friend who drove, drove us around quite a bit, who used to not be disturbed by getting lost. He used to think of it as an opportunity for serendipity. And I thought he was a very wise fellow. That one can be lost or hurt or disappointed and learn from it and become better. You, you also uh, talked about the uh, mutual sort of lack of respect between intellectuals on the one hand and, and sportsmen on the other. You, of course, throw a bridge across these uh, two uh, disciplines. But w why is that? Why, why, why do sportsmen tend to look down upon... I can kind of understand why intellectuals tend to look down upon <laughs> sportsmen, but I can't understand the reverse. <laughs> well, that shows your prejudice. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, well, I think it's that... I think it, hap it starts in childhood. And I think it starts with groups and with discomfort at not being good at things and envy of people who are good at things or better than oneself and you know and sometimes then if you're let's say you're not particularly good at sport but you're quite clever and I think that can it be be intensified by the simple fact of being so uncomfortable about that situation and of and of wanting to do wanting to do more uh, in the in your own sphere and and rising above and looking down on the other and it can happen in reverse too so I, and the trouble is that these things 
intensify. You, uh, coming back to the earlier story you just mentioned about your driver, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful way in which you end your book when you say your, your driver loves to uh, get lost because of the possibilities inherent in getting lost. And, and, and the book ends with, with these two wonderful words, get lost. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a terrific uh, way to end the book and, and all that it has in, in its many layers of wisdom. Uh, I'm happy to have uh, questions. Mr. Braley will take questions from anybody who has uh, on anything that we've spoken so far or anything else for that matter. Good afternoon, Mr. Braley. Uh, I'm asking this, it's a slightly loaded question, but then it's very relevant to the name of your book, On Form. You must have been reading about the Indian captain being trolled in the media for selecting people on form, uh, choosing Rohit Sharma ahead of Ajinkya Rahane, and you know the results. But as a psychoanalyst and the mother of all captains, how would you Ouch. look at things differently? <laughs> the grandmother. Would you, would, you, would you think differently? I think it's a very it's a very good question. I mean, people, the the, the um, cliche which has a lot of truth in it is that um, what is it? Form is temporary, but class is permanent, and um, there's a lot of truth in that. On the other hand, it's very difficult to be picked for very big, challenging matches if you're out of form. I mean, you know, your form. The trouble with form is it tends. To, maybe you can see me better. But, but, Form tends to um, it, it tends to run on, you know. I mean, in other words, if you if you lose form, you start to think you're no good. You get worse form. If you you know, so the the risk is that being out of form, you get more out of form, and then it's difficult to turn it round. So uh, I, I sympathise with the selectors actually, and I don't know the detail of it, but. Um, I think in the end you have to pick the very best players. Uh, speaking of form, I'm curious to know if you have uh, your opinions on what happened to Mark Ramprakash. He was a prolific scorer for your county. Mark Ramprakash. Yes, and he was a prolific scorer for your county. Yes. I mean, it was extraordinary the kind of scores he, uh, for your county as well as for Surrey after that. Yes. But he somehow never really made it on the world stage. What do you think happened? Well, I have, I have written about that, and um, the, the, ans the only answer I have, because I asked the same question, but the person I asked was Ian Chappell. And Ian Chappell said he thought he was too interested or concerned about playing the right classical shot, both because he wanted to be a classical orthodox player and because he wanted it to look good. So he would play a shot, and he would hold it, now, actually, that's a skill, and that's an important thing. But Chappell said he, he didn't r remember that the main point of being a batsman was to score runs. And that so if you got a ball, you could play defensively. If you could knock it that way a bit, or that way a bit, or that way a bit, you might be able to get a one or a two. And Chappell was a great exponent of that. And I suspect that there was some truth in that. So there's an example of a particular kind of form obstructing someone in their success. And I think he then, it then started to get to him about not doing as well in test cricket as he would have liked and as people expected. Gentleman here, yes. Yeah. You know, you, during your playing days, yeah. sorry, your playing days, 1981 particularly, Ian Botham, somehow you were able to get the best out of him. When you were captain, he always performed very well. What is the magic behind that? Well, we got on, oddly enough. We were totally different people. He mm -hmm. was uh, a bit of a reprobate. He was a bit of a... Uh, he was f full, fully uh, emotionally involved, aggressive, attacking, wanted to attack everything. Um, it tried this and tried that. I said so earlier, didn't I? Um, I was also lucky I was his first captain for England. So he was a young chap, and he was obviously not going to be difficult with me to start with. And uh, I think we got a good relationship going. I could tell him at times to relax and let himself go, and I could tell him when he had to rein himself in. 
and at Headingley I did both. I told him to let himself go as a bowler, I mean as a batsman, but also to uh, of change his style of bowling. And I took him off after three overs, and he said, I can't bowl in three overs spells, and I said, well, I can't bowl you if you bowl medium pace half volleys. And he's, he was a bit angry about that. So, uh, I mean, it was that we had a good relationship and that I could get on with him well as well. And he enlivened, he enlivened me, as I think I helped him. Good evening, Mike. Good evening, Mike. Uh, I have this question. Um, have you had an opportunity to uh, talk to any of the Indian captains, especially MS Dhoni, who's also a very people person? Have you had an opportunity to do some psychoanalysis uh, about his style of captaincy and how he deals with people and his teammates? Uh, because there's something that you share with him. Both, are, both of you are afraid of heights. <laughs> Uh, not much else we shared, I'm afraid. I wish, wish I could play like him. Um, well, I'm, I'm afraid the answer is no. I've only met um, MS Dhoni once for a few minutes, uh, and we didn't talk at any great depth. Um, but uh, no, I, I can't really. A small tip from Chennai, uh, that'll be the, it'll be a whole book by itself, if you do an analysis on him. <laughs> no, I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't risk it. Not even in Chennai. It's a general question. To be an effective captain, whether you should remain as a democratic or authoritative or task oriented, which kind of uh, leadership is better for the captain? Will it be a democratic person or authoritative person or task oriented? There are different kinds of leadership. I want to know which is the most suitable ah. in the cricket uh, context. Demo democratic captain, or authoritative captain, or task oriented captain? Very good question. I mean, I think you certainly have to be task-oriented. You have to respond to the situation in front of you. You have to be down to earth, like the batting I was talking about in um, Greg Chapel. As for democracy and authoritative, I've always strongly believed in a shallow uh, triangle of hierarchy. Um, that you need ideas can come from anyone. You never know where the next good idea will come from. It could come from a junior person, it could come from someone in the second team, it could come from a gatesman, it could come from, it could even come from a member of the press. You know, it could come from anywhere. Um, so I think you have to be open to people's opinions and you have to encourage them to have op opinions. At the same time, there isn't time for a long consultative democratic process before you change the bowling. And at that moment, you have to take the decision and take their criticism later, or their comments later. So you need to be firm and clear, but in the background, there has to be openness to everyone else. Yeah, there's a mic coming to you. There's a mic behind you. Thank you. Uh, given your background as a psychologist, psychotherapist, would you be able to share what psychological attributes would you look for if people will be successful in making a comeback. A comeback at what? Well, they have been out of form, they have been laid out of the team, they are trying very hard to come back into the team. So the thing is, apart from their cricketing skills, apart from the fitness attributes, apart from other things, there is something of a mental makeup. So what attributes would you look for uh, to see whether this guy has a greater chance of making a successful comeback? You know, I, I, it's very difficult to speak in general terms, but I would say if I had to answer that question, resilience. Resilience. Somebody who can be relied on even when things are going difficult, they're difficult for that person, that they don't give up too quickly, that they can stay with it, they can keep hold of their good qualities. I think, obviously, for somebody to be picked again, they have to be playing well and on form, reasonably on form, but to look for the person in whom that is present. That's it. Uh, sorry, sorry, sir. We, we need to wind up now. We're out of time. Sir. Well, I've been uh, wa uh, waiting for a long time, sir. No, you have asked the question. That's yeah. fine. Uh, how many years you played test cricket, sir? And uh, what is the period? Uh, that is a year, correct year. And uh, how many years were the captain, sir? How many yeah. years was I a captain? Of England? Four. The rest, the rest you can check on cricket Actually, four or on wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fair to ask the guest the question. You should do your homework. Thank you very much.
it's been a wonderful you've been a wonderful audience thank you very much mike it's been such a pleasure thank, thank you. you very much thank you thank you very much indeed